Domination require unequal power. Callum Zavos McRae, The Philosophical Quarterly, published the 18th of November, 2024. Abstract until recently, many theorists define the domination such that it requires unequal power, and most others held that even if domination were not defined as requiring unequal power, a requirement of unequal power would nevertheless follow from the definition of what domination is. On these views, unless there is an imbalance of power between the two parties, there can be no relation of domination. However, two prominent theorists have recently broken from this consensus, on the grounds that people can depend on one another's arbitrary or uncontrolled wills, even in contexts where there is no inequality of power. In this paper, I argue that this is a mistake. Domination theorists have a powerful reason to hold that domination cannot take place without a power imbalance. Consequently, we should only accept definitions of the concept on which domination requires unequal power domination, republicanism, relational egalitarianism, independence, freedom, power. According to Christopher McCammon, writing in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophies, SEP, Entry for Domination, theorists of domination tend to agree about this much. Domination is a kind of unconstrained, unjust imbalance of power that enables agents or systems to control other agents, all the conditions of their actions. McCammon 2018, my emphasis point one however, since that sentence was written Andreas Schmidt has presented a case against that consensus, according to Schmidt. Domination theorists should not agree that domination need involve any imbalance of power. Schmidt 2018. Moreover, Schmidt's argument has recently been endorsed by Frank Lovett, one of the most significant domination theorists of recent decades. Lovett 2022, 167. The center of Schmidt's argument is the following case. You live in a Wild West setting where everyone, including yourself, is an incredibly good shot. Whoever shoots first will kill another person with near absolute certainty. Whenever someone shoots someone, their death is neither revenged nor, because there is no law or law enforcement, prosecuted, 2018, 185.2. The Wild West case inspires the following argument against the claim that domination requires unequal power. To be dominated is to depend on an alien will that is arbitrary or uncontrolled. The individuals in Wild West depend on one another's arbitrary or uncontrolled wills. 3. There is no power inequality in Wild West. Everybody has equal power, so, domination is possible in equal power contexts, and so does not require unequal power. If this argument succeeds, we have a powerful reason to reject the claim that domination requires unequal power. This has considerable downstream consequences for how we understand domination's place in contemporary political philosophy. For example, it seems to undermine the claim that domination is best understood as a distinctly inegalitarian wrong, and as such it seems to undermine the relational egalitarian claim that we can understand opposition to domination as rooted in a commitment to the importance of people relating to one another on a firmly equal footing Norman 1997. Anderson 1999, Hinton 2001, O'Neill 2008, Schemmel 2021. If there is domination in the Wild West case, then, given that there don't seem to be any relevant inequalities between the gunslingers, domination can't be adequately understood solely as an inegalitarian wrong Schmidt 2018. In this paper, however, I argue that we should reject the anti-egalitarian argument above. The objective is not to provide fuel for a critique of the Republican understanding of domination as a kind of unfreedom though neither is the paper particularly concerned to defend Republicanism. The central objective is focused on the concept of domination rather than the tradition of Republicanism. The paper seeks to defend the understanding of domination as a distinctly inegalitarian evil for the main strategy for undermining the anti-egalitarian argument is to argue against premise 1. I will argue that it is false that one is dominated whenever one depends on the arbitrary will of another. The argument is essentially a reductio if one accepts that domination is simply arbitrary will dependence, unequal power or not, then one will have to accept a series of other claims that all domination theorists, Republicans included, have strong independent reasons to reject. The paper proceeds as follows. Section I reviews the ways in which domination theorists have thought about unequal power, 
and shows how the Wild West case undermines a standard argument for supposing that arbitrary will dependence itself entails a requirement of unequal power. Section 2 argues that rejecting the unequal power requirement forces us to significantly revise our concept of domination in ways few domination theorists would be comfortable with. Section 3 argues that any theory of domination that rejects the unequal power requirement will contravene two important desiderata that any theory of the concept should meet. 1. That the theory explains what's objectionable about paradigm domination cases, such as the kindly slave master and the benevolent despot. And 2. That the theory explains why domination, per se, constitutes a serious political and moral complaint. Section IP considers some objections to the argument I put forward, and Section 5 concludes with some thoughts about its implications for domination theory, relational egalitarianism, and republicanism. I domination and unequal power theories of domination usually begin by identifying their target phenomenon ostensibly. Pettit 1997. 5. Love it 2010. First to second. McCammon 2015, 1028. Imagine a kindly master in a slave society, who is disposed not to use the power over his slaves, that legal and social institutions grant him, or a decent husband in a patriarchal society, or a benevolent dictator. In cases like these, the slave, the wife, and the subject might be able to do much of what they would have done were it not for the superordinate party, nevertheless. Many share a strong sense that there is something deeply objectionable about the fact that the superordinates in these relationships have the sort of power that they have over their subordinates. The term domination describes the objectionable relationship that is instantiated by each of the paradigm cases just described. One way to proceed from that point is to claim that that objectionable relationship is a particular kind of unjustified power imbalance. This, as we saw, is how McCammon sets things up in his SEP entry, on this sort of approach. Power inequality is a basic requirement for something's being a candidate for domination. And the main task of a theory of domination, is to tell us when and why such inequalities count as unjustified. And if this is the basic idea that we have in mind when we start out searching for a theory of domination, we will take it for granted that domination requires unequal power. Note that this is the case even if we argue, as many domination theorists have, that power inequalities are unjustified just when they involve dependence on an arbitrary will. Arbitrary will dependence will still play an important role in such a theory, but domination without unequal power will nevertheless be ruled out by the theory's structure. Correspondingly, some definitions of domination explicitly involve a condition that requires unequal power. 5. Call this broad model the unequal power approach to understanding domination. Another way to proceed, however, is to hold that the objectionable relationship in question is just dependence on an alien, or that is arbitrary or uncontrolled. On this sort of approach, arbitrary will dependence is the basic requirement for some things being a candidate for domination, and the main task of domination theory is to tell us when and why a relationship between two people amounts to arbitrary will dependence. On this sort of understanding, it may well turn out that domination is not possible without an imbalance of power, if it turns out that arbitrary will dependence itself requires unequal power, but no such result will be guaranteed by our basic approach in the way that the unequal power condition is required by the unequal power approach. Correspondingly, we also find definitions of domination that do not involve any requirement of unequal power. 6. Call this the pure arbitrary will dependence approach. 7. Most philosophical work on domination over the last 25 years or so has proceeded on the supposition that it does not much matter which of these two basic approaches we start with, as each route will arrive at roughly the same destination. On the one hand, starting with the unequal power approach, we can, as we've seen, fill in our account of what makes unequal power unjustified with arbitrary will dependence. On the other hand, Arbitrary will dependence has often been thought to entail an unequal power condition because of what we can call the positionality of arbitrary power argument Pettit 1997, 67 8, 2008, 108 to 110, Love it 2010, 120, Pansadi 2013, 618 20, 
according to the positionality of arbitrary power argument, unconstrained, arbitrary power, is positional in the sense that the degree to which one has such power over another is a matter of how much one has relative to that other, rather than one's absolute amount. The basic thought is that if two people have equal power over one another, then they can each use that power to constrain or control the power of the other party, and so that party's power will not count as arbitrary or uncontrolled. If you have more arbitrary power over me than I over you, then, to that extent, you can exercise that power over me with impunity, since I won't have the power to constrain your actions. But equal powers seem to cancel one another's arbitrariness. If I have as much power over you as you do over me, then my power acts as a check to constrain yours, and vice versa, in which case, so long as power is equal, any will dependence will be sufficiently controlled so as to cease to be arbitrary. There will be no possibility of dependence on an arbitrary will when power is equal. If the positionality of arbitrary power argument succeeds, there is little reason to worry about which understanding of domination we adopt. So long as arbitrary will dependence supplies a plausible account of what makes unequal power unjustified, both the unequal power approach and the arbitrary will dependence approach will amount to the same basic understanding of domination at the end of the day. 8. However, Wild West shows that the positionality of arbitrary power argument fails. In Wild West no one will be able to retaliate if someone shoots them, and nobody else will retaliate on their behalf. So, their power cannot act as an effective check on the power of their fellows. Consequently, we have massive dependence on arbitrary, uncontrolled alien wills, but perfectly equal power. The case thus drives a conceptual wedge between the two understandings of domination described earlier too. Is there domination in Wild West? As we've just seen, Wild West forces us to choose between the unequal power approach to domination and the pure arbitrary will dependence approach. Which should we choose? One reason to think that we should choose the arbitrary will dependence approach is that the relations in Wild West seem to share some of the central features of standard domination cases. Indeed, we might be tempted to think that the relations in Wild West resemble standard domination cases closely enough for us to have sufficient reason to conclude that domination is taking place in the case. And since Wild West involves high degrees of arbitrary will dependence and no asymmetries of power, that amounts to a reason to abandon the unequal power requirement. For a start, the relations between people in Wild West certainly seem to involve a high degree of vulnerability. Everybody in Wild West is in the precarious position of owing their lives to the forbearance of their fellow gunslingers. Similarly, it certainly seems correct to describe the individuals in Wild West as living at one another's mercy in an objectionable way. Pettit 1997, 61, 63, 4, McCammon 2015, 1033. As a result, the individuals in Wild West seem to suffer from a high degree of uncertainty and insecurity, of just the sort that domination theorists have long argued is another trademark sign of domination. Pettit argues, for example, that a central evil of domination is that it forces the dominator to endure a high level of uncertainty, since the arbitrary basis on which the interference occurs means that there is no predicting when it will strike, which in turn makes planning for the future difficult, reduces the dominator to a state of perpetual anxiety, and even threatens to sap them of ambition, since there is little point in making detailed plans for an uncertain future, Pettit 1997, 85 6, C. 2. Schmidt 2018, Lovett 2022, 75, 193. This certainly seems to apply to the individuals in Wild West, who must live under the constant fear of random death, unable to plan for a future that they can't be sure they will be around to enjoy. The Wild West relations also seem to involve at least some of the pressures of ingratiation that have long been taken to be amongst the key hallmarks of domination relations. A common theme amongst domination theorists in describing the condition of domination is that the dominated are presented with powerful incentives to ingratiate themselves with their dominators, to keep them sweet, and to keep a weather eye on them, anticipating what they will expect of you and trying to please them, or anticipating where they will be and trying to stay out of their way. Petit 2012, 109, C2 Pettit 1997, 867, 2005, 
Love It 2022, 75, 107.9 and, though we will see some cause for qualified skepticism on this point later, some of these pressures certainly seem to be in place in Wild West. If every gunslinger in town has the power to take your life with impunity, you do well to keep an eye on them, and you do well not to get into anybody's bad books. If that's what is meant by ingratiation and keeping people sweet, then again it certainly looks like those things are taking place in Wild West. And finally, a related idea here is the thought that in Wild West, as in standard domination cases, people are going to be forced into important relationships with others without an appropriate degree of control and consent. In Schmidt's words, you will be forcefully entangled with the lives of others, and their power over you means that you cannot afford not to attend to your relations with them to a significant degree. No matter how much you might want to be rid of them, Schmidt 2018, 193, if Wild West seems to have all of this in common with standard domination cases, isn't it clear that we should admit that it's a genuine case of domination, and so reject the unequal power approach in favor of the pure arbitrary will dependence view? There are, however, a series of important respects in which the relations in Wild West do not resemble standard domination cases, so much so that it seems that we will be forced to revise the concept quite drastically if we decide to reject a requirement of unequal power and so allow that domination takes place in Wild West. The first and most obvious way in which we will have to revise the concept of domination is that we will have to reject the widespread and plausible claim that to be dominated is to be relegated to a kind of inferior status. Though the claim that this is in some sense the heart of domination's moral character might be a distinctly relational egalitarian idea. The claim that domination does represent a sort of status inequality is nevertheless widely endorsed by domination theorists of various stripes. But we will have to jettison the claim if we abandon the unequal power condition, as we will have to admit that domination can take place even in conditions where there is no ground for any allegation of status inequality. We will thus not be able to say with Pettit, for example, that to be dominated is to fail to stand to one's dominator on equal terms, 1997, 61, 87, or that it is to occupy an inferior social status, 2012, 298, and we will likewise not be able to say with McCammon that to be dominated is to be weak in the face of uncontrolled strength, McCammon, 2018. Relatedly, we will not be able to say that domination is a kind of subordination or subjugation. And we will also have to abandon the idea that the capacity to look others in the eye without shame or embarrassment is a good test for the absence of domination, that the ideal of non-domination represents an ideal of being able to stand on one's own two feet and to walk tall, having a standing on a par with others, an ideal of being able to look others in the eye, not showing fear or deference, and not seeking grace or favor, Petit 2005, 105, C2 Pettit 1997, 88 9, 2012, 5, 60, 166. There is certainly a sense in which the individuals in Wild West have a reason to fear one another, and they might have a reason to seek one another's grace and favor to minimize the risk of being killed, but it's hard to see why they should struggle to look one another in the eye or walk tall amongst each other and hard to see why they might suffer from the sense of shame or inferiority that might inhibit carrying themselves in that way if they were subjected to a standard domination relation, such as in a kindly master case. It's certainly hard to see why we would want to deny that they have a standing on a par with others, or that any is subordinated or subjugated to any other. More troublingly still, Allowing that the relations in Wild West are relations of domination also threatens the claim that to be dominated is to have a master. It's far from clear that we should describe any of the individuals in Wild West as being subjected to a master, even in the extended sense that we might allow for descriptions of, for example, workers with tyrannical bosses or the subjects of despots as subjected to the will of a master. But in that case it seems we have to leave behind the claim often referred to as a sort of bedrock datum by domination theorists, that the relevant understanding of domination with which theorizing should begin is domination in its original meaning, as a sort of personal rule or mastery. Love it 2010. 3.10 again.
the individuals in Wild West are vulnerable to one another, and they certainly have powerful reasons to keep a careful eye on each other, but it seems wrong to describe them as subject to the mastery or personal rule of one another. So, if what we thought we were doing when we were constructing a theory of domination, was constructing a theory of what it is to be subjected to mastery and personal rule, we seem to have good reason to hesitate before accepting a definition of the term that tells us that domination is taking place in Wild West. For similar reasons, the claim that domination can be thought of as a kind of servitude. Skinner 2003, 247, Pettit 2005, 105, Frausilis 2023, 3765, seems to fall by the wayside too. The individuals in Wild West don't seem to be well described as relating to one another as servants. Similarly, another important claim that domination theorists have often made is that being dominated prevents one from occupying a certain sort of discursive status, from being taken seriously as, in Pettit's words, a voice worth hearing and a near worth addressing, Pettit 2002, 351. The dominated, so the thought goes, will not be taken seriously in discursive contexts, and so relations of domination undermine the sort of relations of respect that are required for genuine public deliberation. Petty 2005, Force 2013, 101-2. Again, we might see some of this sort of phenomenon in the Wild West case. Part of the worry about discursive status in contexts of domination seems to be a worry that if it is common knowledge that the dominated are subject to ingratiation incentives, there will be reason to suppose that what they say is less credible, since they are answering to incentives that might cause them to exaggerate or dissimulate, and to the extent that we think that those incentives will still be around in Wild West, we might worry that this problem will remain too, but again the effects on discursive relations will be very different to standard domination cases. People in Wild West may have reason to worry that when other people speak, they're just trying not to get shot but they won't feel the sort of deprivation of discursive status or relegation to an inferior position in a hierarchy of discursive esteem that we might think is a central feature of such effects in unequal power contexts. Moreover, each will be safe in the knowledge that each of their fellows has a powerful reason not to treat them as a nobody pet at 1997-71, given that they have as much power to take away the lives of their fellows as their fellows have to take away theirs, their fellows will ignore them at their peril. It's one thing to be one voice and ear amongst a multitude, all of whom are taken to have equally powerful reasons to be less than fully forthright, but all of whom have a powerful reason not to ignore one another. It's quite another to be excluded from a sort of basic discursive status that is enjoyed by others, and to be taken to be unworthy of the discursive attention or respect those others receive. Anyone who thinks that the latter phenomenon is an important part of what domination is will have a powerful reason to deny that domination is taking place in Wild West, and so to reject the pure arbitrary will dependence approach to theorizing about domination. And finally, though we might think that there are still some pressures towards ingratiation in Wild West, there is good reason to think that those pressures take on quite a different character to the sorts of pressures that domination theorists have argued to be characteristic of domination relations. As we noted earlier, there will still be reasons to tread cautiously in Wild West, since everyone would do well to be sure they don't give anyone else a reason to shoot them, but that ingratiation pressure will not have the sort of inflection that it is usually given by domination theorists, which seems unavoidably an egalitarian. Consider, for example, Pettit's description of the ingratiation that occurs in domination as a situation in which one has to fall and toady and kowtow in the dominator's direction. One has to ingratiate oneself with them or at least placate and humor them, and has to tug the forelock or tip the cap, acknowledging them as one's superiors and betters. Pettit 2005, 105, though parts of this description might fit Wild West fairly well, the intimations of unequal status simply don't apply. The gunslingers manifestly don't have any reason to acknowledge anyone else as their superiors or betters, and insofar as things like fawning and tugging the forelock are meant to express that sort of relation of inferiority, it doesn't seem like the gunslingers have reason to do those things either. Remember, too, that the ingratiation pressures present will apply symmetrically to everyone, 
That fact is further likely to severely limit the extent to which anyone will feel required to debase or demean themselves. Everyone else has just as much to fear from you as you have to fear from them, and so everyone will have a strong reason to want to make sure that you don't feel like they're making you do something you don't want to do. If the gunslingers are subject to ingratiation pressures in Wild West, then it is quite a different kind of ingratiation to the ingratiation that we are often told is a characteristic mark of domination. It is therefore far from obvious that we should agree that what takes place in Wild West is in fact domination. It certainly resembles domination insofar as it involves vulnerability, insecurity, and uncertainty, and insofar as people live at one another's mercy in an objectionable way, are forcefully entangled with one another, and are subject to at least some of the classic ingratiation pressures that we find in standard domination cases, but it does not look like it involves subordination, subjugation, or inferior standing, it doesn't leave people unable to look others in the eye, it doesn't involve mastery, servitude, or personal rule, it doesn't involve denial of discursive status and the ingratiation pressures that it involves are of a markedly different character to those that we see in standard cases. To be clear, the claim here is not that any of the features just described are necessary for domination, such that we should deny that domination is taking place whenever any one of the above features is absent. No doubt there are individual examples of relations that we would be strongly inclined to describe as domination, but which lack one or other of those features. The structure of the argument is rather that, given that we face a difficult question about whether to embrace an understanding of domination, which extends the concept to Wild West or not, we should consider the extent to which the relations in Wild West share the features that most domination theorists have held to be the characteristic marks of domination relations. If a putative case of domination lacks so many of the features that various different theorists have claimed to be central to the concept of domination, that's a good reason to doubt that it's an instance of the same phenomenon. 3. Further disadvantages of the arbitrary will dependence approach in the previous section. I argued that the relations in Wild West lack many of the features of standard cases of domination with unequal power, and that as such endorsing the judgment that domination is nevertheless taking place will involve a significant revision of our basic understanding of domination, but perhaps such a revision is nevertheless warranted. After all, given that many domination theorists have been operating under the assumption of something, like the positionality of arbitrary power argument, allowing that there can be arbitrary will dependence without domination, might also involve a revision of our understanding of domination. Perhaps the revisions of the concept that rejecting the unequal power condition would require are just necessary theoretical refinements in response to the new insights into the concept provided by the Wild West case. I hope I have already said enough to convince the reader that this is all far from obvious, that we should at least think quite carefully before we decide to jettison the unequal power condition, but, before considering some objections to the suggestion I'm making here, I'd like to offer two more considerations in favor of retaining the requirement of unequal power. The first consideration is that retaining an unequal power requirement is more faithful to one of the central goals of domination theory which is identifying the distinct social wrong that seems to occur in the paradigm cases of the kindly master, the benevolent despot, the decent husband in a patriarchal society, and so on. McCammon 2015, 10301, that these cases are paradigm instances of what we're talking about when we talk about domination, is one of the few data on which all domination theorists seem to agree. But it strikes me as odd to think that things like inferior status, subordination, mastery, discursive hierarchy, and full-blooded ingratiation are not central parts of whatever it is that unites these cases. If we abandon the unequal power requirement, it looks like we have to say that, though these features are present in all of the paradigm cases, because they involve both domination and unequal power. These features are not in fact an integral part of the distinct social wrong that the paradigm cases help us pick out, because that distinct social wrong is domination, and domination can occur without these things. Domination theory will no longer supply us with all of the analytical tools we need to explain that distinct wrong. We will thus have to admit that domination theory alone gives us much less insight into the paradigm cases than we might first have hoped it would. 
The second consideration is that dropping the unequal power requirement makes it considerably less likely that domination will always represent a serious moral complaint. And again I take it that yielding the result that to be dominated is to have a serious moral complaint is something that we should want a theory of domination to do. McCammon 2015, 1031, there is certainly something objectionable about the relations in Wild West, and that objectionableness certainly seems to have a lot to do with vulnerability, uncertainty, and insecurity, but I'm not convinced that those things are connected in the right way to arbitrary will dependence for us to say that wherever we have such dependence, those ills, or indeed, any ills, will also be present. Consider, for example, the following thought experiment, adapted from Matthew Kramer's Gentle Giant case, Kramer 2008, 47-8. Two gentle giants, two gentle giants, G1 and G2, live together in an otherwise unoccupied region far from any other settlements. Both giants are equally possessed of considerable strength, speed, and skill, and each could, if they chose, break the other's neck before the other had any chance to defend themselves. Given their isolation, there would be no repercussions were either to do this. The giants, however, are gentle creatures, and are... Besides, close friends, and wouldn't dream of harming one another. They live a happy life together. G1 and G2 appear to be dependent on one another's arbitrary wills in the same way that the gunslingers in Wild West are. Each could kill the other with absolute impunity at a moment's notice. If G1's will were to change such that she came to will G2's death, there is nothing to stop her from bringing it about but I see no reason to characterize their situation as one of insecurity or uncertainty, and though there does seem to be a sense in which we can say that they are vulnerable to one another, that vulnerability does not seem to be of the troubling variety that we see in Wild West. Indeed, it doesn't seem like there's anything objectionable about the relationship between G1 and G2. Imagine trying to explain to G1 that her vulnerability to G2 reduces her to a condition of perpetual anxiety and uncertainty, that she is at the mercy of G2, that she must live in constant fear of instant death, with constant pressure to keep G2 sweet, and so on. Two gentle giants thus seems to show that arbitrary will dependence, absent a relation of unequal power, is not always objectionable, eleven at the least. The idea that two gentle giants instantiates the same basic sort of objectionable relationship that unites the paradigm domination cases seems to me to stretch credulity. If our approach to domination leads us to that thought, that looks like good evidence that we need to get a new approach, i.v. objections I've argued here that the existing literature on domination contains two subtly, but significantly different basic understandings of the concept the unequal power approach and the pure arbitrary will dependence approach, and that when we see the difference between them clearly, we will see that we have good reason to accept the former, rather than the latter. In this section, I address four objections to this argument. The first objection points out that things look quite different in the Wild West case, if we suppose that there are differential attitudes towards risk and differential rationality. Schmidt 2018, 192. Suppose, for example, that in our Wild West town, Billy the Kid is particularly unaverse to risk while Maze Chicken is particularly risk-averse. Being unaverse to risk, Billy is far more willing to test the waters than Maze Chicken is. He knows Maze Chicken might shoot him if he starts making small threats towards her, but he's willing to take the chance. Miss Chicken, on the other hand, is far more cautious and is not willing to take on the risk of issuing counter-threats. In this sort of context, it seems that Miss Chicken's relationship will take on many of the classic qualities of domination cases. She may well feel that she has to bow and scrape in Billy's presence, that she is reduced to a condition of something very much like servitude, and that he occupies a superior, domineering position of mastery over her. Moreover, something similar seems to apply in cases of irrationality. If Calamity Jane is known to be erratic and irrational, and thus prone to recklessness, then the scrupulously sensible Mr. Mouse may well find himself in the same sort of situation as Miss Chicken. Don't these cases show that domination, even of the classic standard variety, can still arise in conditions of equal power? My response to this objection is straightforward. 
The differential attitudes to risk and differential rationality in these cases amount to power inequalities. Billy the Kid's tolerance for risk and calamity Jane's irrationality are here functioning as resources in virtue of which they have greater power than either Ms. Chicken or Mr. Mouse. The rationale for saying this is clear. In the cases we're imagining, Billy the Kid's daringness and calamity Jane's recklessness give both of them the capacity to do more things than either Ms. Chicken or Mr. Mouse can. Billy and Jane can get Ms. Chicken and Mr. Mouse to perform menial tasks for them, for example. They can get them to fawn over and flatter them, to bow and scrape and so on. Ms. Chicken and Mr. Mouse can't get Billy and Jane to do likewise for them. What is this if not a case of Billy and Jane having greater power over Ms. Chicken and Mr. Mouse than vice versa? One might try to resist this move by defining power in terms of the resources one has to achieve things, rather than in terms of the ability to achieve things. And then defining resources in such a way as to exclude things like attitudes to risk and rationality. Perhaps a non-ad hoc rationale for this could be found though I'm skeptical that it will be easy to find an independently defensible understanding of resources that does the necessary job. Nevertheless, there are two reasons to think that such an appeal would be problematic in this dialectical context. First, though there is some precedent in the power literature for this sort of approach, 12 it is hardly the only nor indeed the most popular approach, and so appealing to it here rests the argument on a controversial claim that many parties to the debate will not feel bound to accept. 13. Secondly, and more worryingly, no parties to the debate on domination explicitly endorse the sort of understanding of power that would be needed here, with most endorsing incompatible approaches. Take Lovett, for example, who has probably done more than any other to offer a detailed analysis of the relevant notion of power for domination theory, and who recommends that we understand power as people's ability to bring about outcomes, if desired, by employing strategies in their opportunity set and who goes out of his way to show that power is sensitive to the preferences of those over whom it is wielded. Love it 2010, 68, 17 in a point one four. Schmidt does anticipate this move noting that one might object that, beyond external social power, the different attitudes themselves constitute power inequalities, just like false consciousness and adaptive preferences can. Schmidt attempts to forestall the objection by pointing out, first, that the preferences and risk dispositions involved in cases like Billy the Kid and Miss Chicken are very different from the usual false consciousness cases because they seem entirely reasonable, and do not originate from oppression, and secondly that the adequate Republican response should be to change the underlying external power relations, rather than demanding that the person become more daring, Schmidt 2018, 191 2. However, it is not the case that claiming that differential risk aversion and rationality can amount to significant inequalities of power, must proceed via an analogy to fraught questions of adaptive preferences and false consciousness. As we've seen, that claim proceeds only under a widely accepted understanding of power, according to which power is understood in terms of abilities to bring about outcomes. Moreover, the question of whether a Republican, or any other opponent of domination for that matter, should demand that the risk-averse person should become more daring is a different question to the one at hand which is whether they are less powerful than their more daring counterpart. Saying that risk aversion makes for less power in cases like these is perfectly consistent with saying that there are still many reasons why we might recommend that risk averse people do not simply throw caution to the wind to augment their power. Getting more power is not the only thing that matters, even when doing so is a means of reducing power inequalities. Finally, it's also worth noting that sometimes encouraging people to become less risk-averse does seem like a good thing to recommend, precisely because it can be a means to counter dominating power. It's plausible to think that part of the good done by organizations like the Black Panthers or feminist consciousness raising groups is that they help raise the confidence and reduce the risk aversion of people subject to domination in order to empower them to resist various strong pressures to live one's life in the shadow of the dominator. So much for the worry about differential risk aversion and rationality. Here's a second objection. If the argument I've offered succeeds, it seems to give us a strong reason to reserve the term domination for cases in which we have unequal power. But the Wild West case still seems to be objectionable. 
and its objectionableness seems to be both one related to the fact that it involves arbitrary will dependence and two irreducible to concerns about equality so though the wild west case might necessitate some semantic shifts for example speaking about independence rather than non-domination doesn't it still show that there's a significant kind of objectionable dependence relation that domination theorists have long been concerned with and which cannot be accounted for in egalitarian terms, perhaps, even, that there is a significant kind of social and political ill that can't be adequately understood without accepting something like opposition to arbitrary will dependence as such, and isn't that substantive point the central issue here? Rather than semantic quibbles about how best to define the term domination, Schmidt 2018, 189, FN 28. My first response to this objection is to point out that it is at best a little misleading to describe the question of how we should define domination as a merely semantic concern. Domination is an extremely important political term, and as such it matters how we define it, particularly given the significant role that it plays in important bodies of contemporary political thought, such as feminism, republicanism, and relational egalitarianism. Secondly, and more importantly, though, it's not clear to me that we are left with a distinctive role in political thought for opposition to arbitrary will dependence, as such once we've reserved the term domination for instances of unjustified unequal power. The first reason to doubt that is one we've already seen in the two gentle giants case, which casts significant doubt on the thought that there will always be objectionable vulnerability, uncertainty instability in the like when we have dependence on the arbitrary will of another. The second reason is the related thought that what seems most objectionable about arbitrary will dependence in cases like Wild West are things that can easily be identified as such by alternative pre-existing ideas in political philosophy. For example, if a big part of what is so objectionable about Wild West is a condition of uncertainty and insecurity, we might think that the major problem with Wild West is not arbitrary will dependence as such, but rather the fact that people suffer a high probability of interference. This strongly suggests, in line with the sort of criticism of republicanism that has been put forward by Ian Carter and Matthew Kramer, that much of the concern with arbitrary will dependence as such can be explained away by a familiar concern with negative liberty as non-interference combined with a concern that one makes sure that such liberty is secured by minimizing the probability that such interference will take place Carter 2008, Kramer 2008. Indeed, it is notable that many Republican theorists have moved sharply away from emphasizing the idea that uncertainty and insecurity are amongst the characteristic signs of domination over the years. That idea played a very important role in Pettit's early formulations, for example, but a much less prominent role in his later works. 15. An obvious explanation of why that move occurred is that it was occasioned by a desire to avoid the Carter Kramer line of critique, emphasizing the egalitarian credentials of opposition to domination helps show how a concern with domination is distinct from a straightforward concern with the likelihood of interference, claiming that there is a distinct concern with arbitrary will dependence as such, even if we don't call it domination will mean returning to emphasizing the idea that uncertainty and insecurity are amongst the chief ills to be associated with the objectionable relations in question, and it thus moves squarely back into the line of fire of the Carter-Kramer critique. Thus, the arguments contained in this paper do promise to give us more than just a reason to adopt a particular definition of the term domination. They give us a reason to doubt that there is an independent ideal of absence of arbitrary will dependence, whether we call it independence or something else, that will be left unaccounted for if we adopt an understanding of domination that requires unequal power. What looks like it could be opposition to arbitrary will dependence, as such seems like it might be better explained as opposition to probable interference. And once that thought is taken into account it's not clear that there's any work left for a distinct ideal of independence from arbitrary or uncontrolled wills. 16. This last point also helps address a third objection, which takes its cue from the observation that much of the argument against the arbitrary will dependence approach to domination makes use of certain claims about domination's conceptual role. If one wants a conception of domination that is true to various aspects of how the concept has been understood up until now, 
which does a good job of analyzing the paradigm cases, and which yields the claim that to be dominated is to have a serious prima facie complaint, then one has strong reason to reject the arbitrary will dependence approach in favor of the unequal power approach. But what if we should reject the antecedent of that conditional? Schmidt in particular seems at times to suggest as such, implying that there are good reasons to give the concept of domination a new role, illuminating an underappreciated kind of social wrong with significant novel implications for policy debates. Schmidt 2018, 194 foot 5, pages 199 to 204. One line of response to this objection is to essentially concede the point. If one is prepared to give up on the various hopes about the conceptual role of domination employed in the above argument, then that argument will most likely have much less force for you. But it nevertheless helps us to see what the costs of taking up the arbitrary will dependence approach are, and of just how different republicanism will turn out to be if we abandon the unequal power condition. 17 A second line of response, however, is less concessive, employing the same sort of debunking argument offered in response to the previous objection. If that debunking argument is right, Schmidt's paper simply does not succeed in identifying a helpful new conceptual role for the concept of domination, because the social ills that he identifies are already amenable to satisfactory analysis in terms of the probability of interference. Finally, to the fourth objection, in a recent response to Schmidt, Andreas Bengtsson has argued that there is in fact relational inequality in Schmidt's mutual domination cases. Bengtsson 2022, the basic form of the argument is to appeal to the idea that, since domination is a kind of relational inequality, mutual domination just consists of two people relating to one another in an inegalitarian way, particularly if we think of relational egalitarianism deontically as an agent relative deontic norm that requires people to relate to one another as equals, we have no reason to think that mutual domination cases are not just instances of two individuals each violating their deontic obligations to relate to one another on equal terms. We wouldn't think that there is no inequality when A is B's slave on one day, and B is A's slave the day after, and we wouldn't think there is no inequality if A regards themselves as racially superior to B at the same time as B regards themselves as racially superior to A, so I think that two relational egalitarian wrongs make a relational egalitarian right in mutual domination cases either Bengtson 2022, 634 6. This response seems to me to miss the point of Schmidt's challenge. Schmidt's argument challenges the relational egalitarian to explain why we should think of domination as a relational egalitarian wrong in the first place, given that it appears that we can have arbitrary will dependence in conditions where everybody is perfectly symmetrically placed, and so in which there is no respect in which we can say that any two parties are, or are taken to be, unequal in any regard. In assuming that domination is a relational inegalitarian wrong, Bengtsson thus seems to me to beg the question. The question being, what reason do we have to think of domination as a failure to relate to somebody as an equal at all? The arguments of section 2 in the Two Gentle Giants case both help to drive this point home. In what sense is it plausible to describe the individuals in Wild West as unequal to one another? It doesn't seem right to describe the relations in Wild West as instances of mastery or servitude or as involving discursive exclusion, and so on and so forth. So, what grounds do we have for claiming a failure of relational equality? By the same token, is it really plausible to describe the two gentle giants as failing to relate to one another as equals? Who is regarding, treating, or relating to whom as an inferior or superior in these cases? Tellingly, in responding to an objection along these lines referring to a husband and wife under a patriarchal legal system, who nevertheless succeed in regarding and treating one another as equals, Bengtsson appeals to the idea that there is nevertheless a salient relational inequality, since the state fails to treat the husband and wife as equals in maintaining its patriarchal legal system, Bengtsson 2022, 638. But no such appeal is available in either Wild West or Two Gentle Giants. Pace Bengtsson, I therefore take it that Schmidt's cases do in fact successfully establish that, if domination is arbitrary will dependence, domination is possible without relational inequality. 
v. Conclusion My main objective in this paper has been to argue, against Schmidt and Lovett, that domination does require unequal power, there can be no domination without a power imbalance. My main argument for this claim is that unless we insist that domination requires unequal power, we will be forced to say many things about domination that few domination theorists will be comfortable saying. If we reject the claim that domination requires unequal power, we will have to, one, considerably revise our understanding of what domination is, two, admit that domination theory is not well placed to give us insight into the basic moral character of the paradigm cases, and three, admit that domination is not something that always gives us grounds for a serious moral complaint. Insisting that domination requires equal power is thus the only way to preserve a concept of domination that is fit for purpose. This result is obviously good news for relational egalitarians. It shields a number of their basic claims about domination from the anti-egalitarian argument that we reviewed in the introduction to this paper. But, as I've tried to indicate throughout, I do not think it has to be bad news for Republicans. If one takes the claim that to be dominated is to depend on an arbitrary alien will to be the heart of Republicanism, then the arguments of this paper do seem to undermine Republicanism itself. 18. They would imply that Republicanism is irredeemably inconsistent, committed at its heart to an understanding of domination that can't be made to square with other central claims and goals of the theory. But if one thinks that republicanism could survive in recognizable form without that specific claim, then the unequal power approach to domination does not seem to me to undermine other central claims of the republican tradition. First, it is not clear to me that explicitly affirming the reasoning behind retaining an unequal power requirement need undermine the claim that domination represents an important kind of unfreedom and that we can therefore understand opposition to domination as grounded in a commitment to a particular conception of liberty. It certainly doesn't prevent us from claiming that arbitrary will dependence is a necessary condition of domination. We will just have to insist that it is not independently sufficient, since unequal power is also a necessary condition of domination. Full stop. Secondly, I see little reason to think that explicitly employing an unequal power understanding of domination will necessitate unwanted revisions of other basic cornerstones of Republican thought, signature Republican ideas, such as opposition to power asymmetries that are not appropriately constrained, a strong commitment to popular democratic control in politics and beyond, and an emphasis on the significance of an entrenched civic culture seem at least consistent with, and perhaps even strengthened by, committing to an unequal power requirement. It's worth remembering that, as we saw earlier, Many prominent Republican theorists, such as McCammon and Lovett, included equal power conditions in their definitions of domination until recently, and even those who didn't, such as Pettit, shared the tendency to assume that domination couldn't take place without unequal power. It would therefore be a surprise if explicitly endorsing an unequal power condition were to undermine any central claims of Republicanism. One reason why Republican theorists might still be tempted to adopt the pure arbitrary will dependence approach and drop the unequal power requirement is that doing so seems to put clear distance between their own view and that of relational egalitarian theorists, some of whom have argued that they can capture everything that Republicans seek to capture without inheriting any of its disadvantages, effectively rendering Republicanism otios, Colotney 2023. 27288. But if the arguments of this paper are right, this move risks avoiding the frying pan by heading straight into the fire. Achieving clear distance from the relational egalitarian by severing domination theory from a string of some of its most attractive and plausible claims, as well as rendering it more vulnerable to the Carter Kramer critique. At the very least, the arguments of this paper show that Republicans cannot and should not disavow the unequal power condition without recognizing that this entails considerable and wide, ranging revisions of some of the deepest underlying motifs and claims of domination theory. If Republicanism is fundamentally about the objectionableness of pure arbitrary will dependence, rather than unjustified power asymmetries, it is a very different theory to the one that we have come to understand it to be in recent decades. 19. Copyright the author, S. 2024, published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the Scots Philosophical Association and the University of St Andrews.
This is an open access article distributed under the terms of the Creative Commons Attribution License HTTPS colon slash slash creativeacommons.org slash licenses slash by slash four dot zero slash which permits unrestricted reuse, distribution, and reproduction in any medium, provided the original work is properly cited. Callum Zalvos McRae, Does Domination Require Unequal Power? The Philosophical Quarterly, 2024, Key 140, HTTPS colon, slash slash, doi, dot org, slash 10, dot 1093, slash pq, slash p key 140